good morning, everyone. Uh, for me, it's a real pleasure to introduce the inaugural talk in the series uh, on lectures in material science. Uh, our first guest is uh, Daniel Brunet. He's a uh, German and he has uh, a lot of experience in some material science, uh, especially in photonics. Uh, but uh, I'm going to make a very brief uh, summary of uh, his uh, CV. He started uh, with a PhD in physics in Edinburgh, uh, supervised by a dear friend of us, a common friend. Uh, and uh, he had a postdoc uh, uh, stint in the Balearic Island in the IFISC Institute, which is Institute of Physics of Complex Systems. I think, uh, which is a joint uh, venture between the Balearic Island uh, University and CSIC. Mm. And then he got a position uh, in FEMTO, ST, in France, uh, near or a uh, sort of uh, wave corpuscle uh, entity with the Besançon University, the French Comte Besançon University in France. Um, he's uh, uh, an expert in artificial intelligence uh, and uh, in photonics, and he has um, written many papers uh, dealing with this subject. So uh, his talk today is uh, on 3D additive uh, manufacturing, uh, but with a very special feature, which is uh, CMOS compatibility. Uh, mm -hmm. So I hope he will uh, illuminate us on this uh, very interesting topic and we'll make a very bright uh, initial talk in the series <laughs> of uh, material science. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> so, Good. Uh, Good. Um, so I, how much time do I have? 40? 40, 45 minutes. 45? And then 15 minutes. Uh, right. Questions. Okay. So um, I do have some experience in material science, but I would say my expertise comes from a different direction. But since, since I'm here, I will focus on, let's say, the material science part. Uh, for me, fabrication always was uh, scary. I never wanted to do it. Uh, it's uh, black magic and uh, so obsessive with details to be reproducible. For me, I always wanted to stay out of it. Um, and let the expert do the work, give them the well, make them give me nice lasers or quantum dots or whatever, and then I can have fun with them. I never wanted to do it myself. Um, but then, with all of this neural network kind of renaissance in uh, the last 10 years, I, I got tempted because I saw really some, some, some niche where I think uh, we could explore and I think will become very important in the future. So, and that essentially is what I'm going to talk about. So the 3D additive fabrication. Um, of course, CMOS compatible because in the end, if you just do anything uh, which is, you know, basically ignores the relevance of CMOS, I think you're going to have a very hard time. Um, but the real, the buzzword for me here is scalable and neural network, and that's what I will motivate at the beginning. So normally, I focus much more on this aspect, on these parts, um, because it's what tickles me the most, let's say, as a scientist. Um, but then today I will focus more on this. So if you have questions also towards the neural network kind of uh, ideas, um, I show some slides at the end, but uh, we can discuss on this later on. A uh, few words on Besançon. So we are here, there, and I think it's one of the most important places in optics which nobody has ever heard of. So, um, actually, so I think the most remarkable fact is that Fourier optics was established in Besançon. So, the mathematical concepts were trans uh, first translated to the field of optics by Defieu, and he was a researcher in our institute. Um, so, we have, a, well, maybe on the back of that, we have a very long history, for example, in holography. So here you see one of our holograms. We have this kind of tourist attraction room uh, where we bring the people that come to visit. And that's, I think, up to today, um, the biggest volume hologram in, uh, worldwide. It's from the 70s or 80s. It's the Venus of Milo, and it's really it's like that size. It's pretty impressive if you stand in front of it. 
Um, then we do some other kind of really rather high-tech solutions. So this here, for example, is one of the worst, uh, first uh, miniaturized atomic clocks worldwide. So a lot of people are interested in this. Uh, Army, unfortunately, too. <laughs> uh, and then also we do some stuff in uh, quantum um, technology. So Aurea is a company which becomes pretty... Um, well distributed by now, they do uh, twin photon sources, etc. But maybe most of you know IX Blue, which do lithium nibate, Marcena modulators, they're also from us. So we really have a long history, um, quite good institute, but somehow nobody knows it. <laughs> so this is why I put this slide, uh, try to change it. So, um, and with this, I go to the science of neural networks. And um, here, I think the um, you know, a repeating theme of uh, principles I find just remain well relevant is have a look at, at biology, have a look at, uh, at nature, what it is doing. Because um, ultimately it really, well, I don't want to say it's humbling, but it's, it reminds you on how difficult these things really are. And um, here, this is a slide which shows that uh, scalability is key and how to get there maybe. So what you see here is... Um, a biological measure, uh, a molecular biological measure for energy consumption, for energy. And here on the y-axis, uh, on the x-axis, you see a number of neurons. So this is across many different species. And the different data points here, they are just for different structures in the brain. So for the whole brain, for the cerebellum, or for neocortex. And what you can see here is that really the energy consumption of uh, brains across uh, a huge amount of, uh, of species uh, is linear proportional to the number of neurons inside of a brain. And this is a very key feature and that's very different to what we do today. So to really grasp the relevance of this is we can say we know our brain takes 20 watts of power consumption and it has around somewhere between 10 and 20 billion um, um, neurons plus you know, 1,000, 10,000 connections per neuron whatsoever. So let's assume this is what our brain is doing or we know that the brain is doing it. If we now say we cannot change the power budget, we are power limited, and we build a system um, that scales with an exponent of 1.5, the power consumption versus the number of neurons, then instead of being able to realize a brain or a neural network with 20 billion neurons, we suddenly drop three orders of magnitude, we can only realize neural networks with 5 to 10 million neurons. And then we can go on and say, okay, what with an exponent 2? Then with the same kind of power budget, we can maximally realize um, uh, a brain the size of a, of a house fly, you know, just a normal fly which buzzes around in your, in, in your living room. And the funny thing is that essentially all hardware is, is with an exponent of 2. So this is where we are at the moment, and this is why we are paying so dearly for amazing concepts like, uh, you know, transformer networks, etc. This is why they, they eat energy like crazy. It is because we have roughly, pretty accurately though, an exponent of two. So um, here, if you want to learn more about this whole subject, um, Kwabena Bohan is a guy from Stanford. He's really a pioneer in the field since decades. And he just published a paper in Nature in 2022, where he basically gets across this entire uh, kind of argument, chain of argument. It's heavy, it's uh, supplemental material is, is dense, <laughs> but it's very enlightening for me. So the reason is uh, for this quadratic scaling at the moment, which, uh, which makes us suffer so much, is we can have a look here at the, let's say, canonical structure of neural networks. Yeah, we have neurons which are the circles, and then we have the connections, which are the arrows. Here is a simple feed-forward uh, neural network, meaning information goes from the left to the right. And then these connections between the neurons, they have weights, and this is in the end what we use in order to teach a neural network to do something. So um, all of this more or less was inspired by drawings from Ramon y Cajal from uh, more than 100 years ago, and then picked up in the 40s by some applied mathematicians who try to understand how can you compute with, uh, with a network, you know. And of course they went to Boolean logic because that was the, you know, the stuff of the day. But, you know, this is how it all came. So what really is crucial here in this entire idea is this interconnect. And you can see here, this is this entire branching from, if we say, the neuron, the abstraction of the neuron is this blob in the middle. Yeah? 
And then these are all the connections. And then we can say now is the blob, the neuron, does the nonlinear transformation, while all of these connections, they do a linear connection to other neurons in the network. It's, it's completely wrong. It's much more complex, but this is what we use for our concepts mostly. So, and um, as you can see here, for a fully connected system, the number of connections you get uh, grows quadratically with the number of neurons in our network. And this is in the end where this entire power penalty is coming from. And you can see how this, in, uh, how this contrasts uh, biology with our technology. So in biology, essentially what consumes the energy is the neuron, the soma, the cell body. Whereas in our accelerators, what consumes the energy is the synapse, is all of this kind of connection tree. And this is the kind of fundamental scaling which we need to get around with. Um, so my most general message, I think, therefore, is uh, we need to change our point of view. So in the last decades, we always looked at components. Uh, we make transistors smaller and smaller. We make photonic waveguide losses lower and lower. Uh, up to the degree that we can get single photon nonlinear elements in photonics and people get very excited about this which I think is completely justified for other fields but for neural networks what you actually need to get excited about is how to build a network not how to build a neuron because what it is essential is uh, the slope of this scaling oops oops is the slope of this scaling it's not the offset so if you build the energy, if you reduce the energy of the neuron, you shift this curve up and down, but you do not tilt it. And what we need to get to is tilting it. So, and um, essentially, that is my starting hypothesis. We need to find out how to build networks. If the neuron now consumes a bit more or less energy, I really don't care so much about if it's now one femtojoule or 15. What I want is that they network efficiently. So, um, from this we can go to the integrated optical neural networks and here for me are two crucial papers. The first one published by the MIT in 2017 when they used essentially already fabricated meshes of Marzender interferometers to, to make such an interconnect. So essentially here you have the output of four neurons, there you have this complex uh, interfer uh, interference going on according to all of these mixers. And then you have uh, four outputs where you would basically have the next layer of the neural network. And with this you can fully program the connection from one neuron to all the other neurons. So it does exactly what the mathematical equations uh, tell it to do. Uh, then in 2021 uh, some other technology with phase change materials um, implemented something similar. And uh, basically the huge difference here was that this was for four neurons, this now is for around uh, 50 neurons. So they have a lot of advantages, huge speed, low losses, etc., etc. But you can see they're rather small. Right? There are four neurons, 50 neurons down there. So one might think that this is because in photonics the components are too big. But like I said before, really the single component is not so crucial. It's the scaling. Because you can go back and you can have a look at electronics and you see that it is almost a similar uh, kind of behavior. So here, this is from also Nature 2022, and this is Samsung. This is the research group behind Samsung, or Samsung is behind that research group. So they have money. If they could fabricate something bigger, they could fabricate something bigger. Yet, uh, they also get stuck more or less at 60. So, and the issue is, if you compare this to neural networks, um, this is absolutely inefficient. We have neural networks with thousands or millions of neurons in a layer. So, and the problem here really is that kind of arrangement, this 2D arrangement of building these connections. So this here is what we call a crossbar array. Here you have, for example, the input vector, which is the output from the neurons in one layer. Then with all of these kind of memoristive hardware elements, you can program the strength and the weight of these connections. And let's say here, this would be the input for the following layer. Yeah? So this implements all of the connections fully in parallel, all in analog hardware. But the problem here is the relationship between the area and the number of neurons, and they relate to the energy consumption. So, Therefore, when we go to this kind of, ah, this slide was supposed to come after the next one, okay. 
if we go to this kind of 2D arrangement, um, I think what we have to um, accept is that we cannot implement networks of the full uh, size, so of one thousands or of millions of neurons, because they simply get too big. You can see here, this is, you know, let's say, a hundred microns, more or less, all of these connections. And after that, the energy consumption of switching a wire just becomes too high in order to make it bigger. In photonics, it's not necessarily energy consumption, it's the sheer scale. We are already at millimeter squared chips. So the problem is, if you want to make, um, um, implement a network double in size, you need four times the area, and so on, and so on, and so on. So if you want to go to neural networks with thousands of neurons, in electronics, it's prohibitive because of energy, mostly. In, in photonics, just because of area, because you, know, you talk about a die, which is the size of a table. So if you then say, okay, what we can do is we can tile these kind of matrices. We can divide them in sub-areas. In photonics, these sub-areas, they scale linearly in terms of energy consumption. But the problem is, again, we need then to tile a much bigger area into these sub-areas. So again, we have then a quadratic increase of energy consumption. So ultimately, all of these solutions, in my point of view, as long as they are limited to a 2D implementation, we will never get around this kind of quadratic scaling between area and between energy consumption of the substrate in both of these systems. So that I summarize uh, in this slide, basically condensed with the area. So as we increase the area of a chip, essentially the number of channels, the number of neurons we can implement completely saturates. We cannot get through uh, um, uh, two different orders of magnitude. So if we now look at the brain, the brain really does a completely different uh, strategy. In the brain, on the most high, um, well, higher level, uh, speaking from the high level arguments, we have a, a, a gray matter where we have the majority of neurons. They are very densely connected, but it basically folds around a sheet around our, uh, around our brain. And all of the long-range connections and medium-range connections, they actually go through the volume. So the interconnect is 3D. So the brain and the brain network is a 3D network. And this is absolutely fundamental because if it would not be, it would not fit in, inside of our skull in the end. You could not realize it in hardware. And that is the fundamental difference. As long as we remain hooked to a 2D only integration with this kind of discrete element organization, then we always have this kind of scaling. And if we go with very simple architectures to the 3D arrangement, then immediately we get a linear scaling of area as well as the height of our substrates. And that's essentially where we are starting now. So if we want to do classical 3D photonic integration, what people have done before is just they cascade 2D fabrication. Yeah, they make one layer, they etch it, then they planarize it. I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not really an integrated silicon photonics uh, specialist. They deposit another layer, photo mask, etch it, wash it, etc., etc. So in the end, if you want to get to hundreds or thousands of these kind of layers, which is what you need, it just becomes an insanely complex process, and I also think it will not be competitive economically, just because it's not a single step process. You always need to redevelop, need to redevelop. So we uh, essentially followed a different way, which is this 3D printing based on, um, for the moment, uh, two-photon absorption, two-photon polymerization. So we use a completely normal resin, uh, this here is a resin from the company we have the printer from, from Nanoscribe, and inside of this resin you have a solution of monomers, and you focus a femtosecond laser inside of this drop, in this case it's a liquid uh, 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 photoresin, and then only in the, in the voxel volume, which is a couple of hundred nanometer in dimensions, you essentially form polymer chains, which then interlink, and then essentially in this way form a solid um, uh, polymer material. And with this you can um, print almost uh, arbitrary random 3D structure inside of this liquid, and then you can decide to you know, remove the liquid, develop the, uh, the, the polymer, etc., etc., and then you have your 3D uh, uh, structure embedded. So people started using this for something they called photonic wire bonding. So they used uh, photonic waveguides from point A to B. Um, but they never really tried to build networks. 
And this is essentially where we took off in 2020. So we started with a very simple proof of concept to show what uh, the idea can do. And what you see here is, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the geometric arrangement, but what you can see here, you can imagine this is essentially the dendritic tree of a neuron. So this here would be the output of a neuron. Here is a splitter and then it gets distributed across nine uh, inputs of other neurons. So that's connections to nine, that's not so much. But then you can cascade this and you can do this kind of self-similar fractal structures. And then the interesting bit is that um, the number of connections scales um, exponentially with the number of uh, bifurcations, right? So here we just have exactly the same geometry, just multiplied by a scaling factor 3 printed on top of it. So here this would be an output of a neuron. And now instead of coupling it from 1 to 9, it already couples it to 1 to 81. And if you then put another of these structures on top of it, you see where this is going. So the number of connections um, completely explodes. And what we've done here is we've printed, these are 225 input waveguides and more than 500 output waveguides. And we've printed this within an area of 200 by 200 micrometer square. So compared to the 2D implementation, you can see the vast difference um, if you go 3D. The other part is here that the area um, and the height of all of this scales linear with the number of neurons, the area and the height with the number of connections you want per neuron. So it's a very graceful scaling in this kind of integration strategy. So besides these one to many connections, we also printed already something functional where we wanted to implement convolutional filters. So it's a bit more you know, convoluted already as the word says, but you can see here this is a Uh, vertical features. Uh, this output waveguide is connected to waveguide arranged in, uh, along these two columns. Uh, yes, and these are the nine filters we've implemented and here this is the 3D printed object and you can immediately see if you want to project this on a 2D plane it becomes almost impossible to do all of these connections without, well, it's impossible without intersections and even with intersections it's actually quite tricky. And here we multiplex this then in a, a field of view of, I think this is 20, um, is more than 20 by 20 input pixels and we characterized it and the performance is very close to the design. So this could be the first convolutional layer of an optical neural network. Now the problem here is uh, we have a, uh, we have waveguides that are air cladded and the core is polymer, so you have a rather large uh, refractive index different. And for us it becomes difficult to get below uh, one micron in diameter, just for mechanical reasons. And that means that at most relevant wavelengths, these waveguides are multimode. And that means if you want to split light according, uh, across these uh, bifurcations, then actually the transfer of intensity to the outputs is not strictly reproducible. Statistically speaking, it is, but if you characterize device from device, there's a large variation simply because you cannot control the speckle pattern at this kind of bifurcation points so well. So for us, therefore, the next step in the development was that we can 3D print single mode uh, waveguides and single mode optics. So for this, we used a uh, pretty fundamental um, relationship, which is called the Clausius uh, relationship, that essentially states the more molecules you have in a volume, the higher its refractive index. And you can use this um, essentially when you start with your monomer resin, uh, the, the transformation efficiency from monomer to polymer depends on the, 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 the power deposited in that voxel. So in other words, if you increase the writing power of your femtosecond laser, you will transfer more of the monomers into polymers, so you get a denser material and with this, the refractive index goes up. And this has been also characterized a couple of years before we started, or one or two years. And here you can see these dependencies uh, as a function of two photon power or at, as the one photon polymerization dose um, over here. So and this is what we, uh, what we leveraged in order to print classical um, waveguides that have a polymer cladding. Because with this, we can go to refractive indices uh, uh, differences you can see here on the order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, which is very close to normal fibers, so it makes it rather easy. Uh, you have cores on the micrometer scale. And this is uh, what we started with. So here, this was our first uh, 
step and graded index uh, waveguides. This here essentially shows you our developed uh, polymer cube. These little rods sticking out here are the cores and we write these cores, they're just uh, uh, vertical columns at the moment or in this uh, case, we write them with a higher power than the surrounding material and then they just become um, very uh, good waveguides actually. So here on the top what we did is we varied the power for the core as a step index, uh, as a step function. So in the end we have a classical confinement uh, with a step uh, refractive index profile. Here we simply varied the power quadratically, uh, so well, parabolically, with uh, the radial position in the waveguide core. And with this we got, uh, we printed graded index uh, waveguides. And all of this was uh, done in collaboration with uh, Demetri Psaldis at APFL who was uh, also essentially the pioneer of optical neural networks and uh, since he is an old uh, holography uh, aficionado he used the same technique which we developed uh, together to print uh, 3D volume holograms and there are some very good arguments why you want to 3D print them. So this is where we started to essentially gain control over the modes. Um, the issue here is first we found out that these waveguides are yeah. So how the pointer died? No. So these waveguides are a bit high loss. We didn't understand really why. And the other part also is they're very slow to fabricate because you need to also two photon polymerize the entire uh, cladding, the entire surrounding material of the waveguide. And that really becomes very slow in terms of fabrication. So what we decided to do is to combine one photon and two photon polymerization because if you've seen at the slide before, with both you can control the refractive index essentially by the exposure doors uh, of the light source. So what we need the high resolution for and the high quality essentially is the waveguide cores. Uh, we want them to be very well defined in terms of diameter, smooth surfaces, you know, good quality. So what we do is now we print these waveguide cores with very high resolution. But for all of the mechanical support, what we uh, have to fabricate it around it, uh, we really don't care. It can, be, it can be very bad in optical quality because light will never touch it. So what we do here is we essentially increase the power almost to a maximum before the material burns and increase or decrease the resolution. So we space the voxels very part, uh, far apart. So this material will not be uniform, it will not be homogeneous, not, not beautiful. And then what we are left with is um, essentially the final features which are um, um, the cladding of the waveguides and that's let's say the dead circuit of uh, the dead volume of the circuit. And this we now just um, polymerize with one photon polymerization with a single uh, you know, exposure inside of a UV chamber. We put the circuit, we print it, we develop it and afterwards we stick it in the UV chamber for 5 to 20 seconds depends on what delta n we want. And with this then we polymerize in one go the rest of the circuit and uh, again the fundamental properties of those are I think this is the best dependency I've ever measured. I mean so the red line is the fit to the Bessel function, the blue is the experimental data. It's really absolutely textbook uh, perfect single mode uh, waveguides. We can control the spatial frequency the, uh, of the waveguide and through that the numerical aperture very well. Um, this whole process is, uh, is really pretty much, um, well, in my case now understood and I think uh, uh, we're going into a direction where we can build really high performance photonic integration. So at the moment we are around uh, uh, 1 dB losses per millimeter, propagation losses, so 10 dB per centimeter. So that's one order of magnitude at least too high to where we want to be. Um, but what you can see here is just how reproducible this fabrication is because here these are waveguide lengths from I think starting 30 microns until 6 millimeters so here you can see one of those and uh, for almost every data point here we printed a new sample, we developed it and we optically characterized it so we had to realign all of our system yet you can really see how this perfectly follows um, um, the line um, and uh, here we got down to 0.2 dB injection losses and this 1 dB per millimeter um, propagation. So the material absorption is still two orders of magnitude lower. So I think uh, we know where this is uh, coming from, the higher losses. I can't say much more to it. 
But I, my intuition is that the step when we started to include the one photon polymerization of the, let's say, the cladding, reduced the losses by one order of magnitude. So I think the problem is simply because of the power fluctuations in the writing laser that we simply get some backscattering, etc. But I, this is not proven at all yet. So this is how we integrated now 3D linear waveguides, but this of course is not a network. We connect from point A to point B. So what we need to do is we need to split the optical power. So the first, uh, like in the like in the air cladded uh, solution I showed you, where we go from one to nine and then print that on top of another one to nine, and then we get what to one to eighty one. So what we started with first was uh, instead of doing directional couplers, we started to do adiabatic uh, couplers, adiabatic splitters, because they're less sensitive. Um, so what you can see here is uh, this would be an input waveguide, for example, and then we just have a taper. So we expel the optical mode, uh, put it into the cladding essentially, and then around that waveguide we group other waveguides with an inverse taper that in the end adiabatically accepts the optical mode and confines it again uh, to its adiabatically changing confinement potential. Uh, we looked at different tapering strategies, either like, a, you know, like an ice cream cone or more like a toothpaste where you have planar uh, tapers in the direction you want to couple. Uh, we did one to two, one to three, one to four couplers. We now have printed more, so one to five, one to six, etc. And uh, we've done quite a few fundamental studies, so that's now that paper essentially is accepted, so I hope it's going to be published in a couple of, in a month or so. Um, and again, what we see is that um, for the right parameters, which are again very close to textbook, we get coupling losses which are, which are below 0 0.1 dB per taper, per basically uh, coupling section. So I think the overall story for this now is really if we pursue this kind of 3D integration, we can go towards a new type of optical integration which aims at really highly connected systems. Yeah? I think if you want to reproduce a normal kind of linear architecture where you just have to mix a bit of signals going down the chain um, as in most sensing applications, etc. Then, you know, this is not, I think, as soon as you need to have a very high degree of interconnectivity inside of your circuit. I think this technology really has a lot of potential. Um, so why we went for these kind of tapered couplers was also because we wanted to show that it's very wavelength agnostic. Because if you want to do these kind of um, direction splitters, you need to have uh, the interference conditions such that you have 50-50 splitting all the time. Because in the end, it's an interference between the two uh, coplanar propagating paths. In this adiabatic system, you just expel the mode. So you do not really care. You change your adiab adiab adiabaticity yes. of the system, but there is no resonances really in this, uh, uh, in this way. So we created our couplers and uh, characterized them from 500 until almost one micron and we stay all the time below 3 dB, uh, we have less than 3 dB losses. So I think for some applications this can also be really interesting. From there now we did the next step where we say okay, so now we have, can do 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, etc. couplers. And now again we need to show this kind of exponential increase of the connectivity. <laughs> So we do this kind of fractal arrangement of couplers where we put, this here would be one in the, uh, input waveguide, we split it into one to four, which is followed by another four one to four coupling sections. And then we have here our 16 outputs. So this is the white light image of the, of the output circuit and that essentially is the intensity distribution. So the global losses, including injection losses, splitting losses and propagation losses, they are again around one dB. The uniformity here is not yet uh, perfect, and I think we also understand this now. It is uh, it's actually it's do something uh, quite unique to 3D fabrication. So if you 3D print a circuit, imagine you now have a tapered coupler followed by an inverse taper. So you come from the bottom, you write your array of four inverse tapers, and then you in the middle of that you write your taper. So that taper is not fixed in space, it will just slowly drop down and basically destroy your circuit. So what we need to, uh, what we came up with is that we use some, something like a sticking layer. We use very low intensity for polymerization to essentially glue these pieces together as we print them, 
which has almost no refractive index um, uh, effect for confinement, but it is fixated in space. So the problem now is at the low power ratio, uh, at the low power dosage, you have a very large gradient for the delta for the n, the refractive index, with power fluctuations. So what we think is happening is that as we print the sticking layer, the printing laser has a bit of power fluctuations, and that essentially moves our refractive index up and down. And therefore we get asymmetric uh, splitting ratios, especially as soon as we go uh, to, to these kind of higher um, uh, degrees of coupling. So that is what you see, can see here. So right now, this is again a speculation, um, but I think this is where we're at. Okay, so these are then, let's say, our splitters. And since a year or so, we have started now, and uh, uh, here you can see the CMOS were maybe a bit overstated. <laughs> so uh, essentially, we now go full circuit, and this is also circ uh, circle, this is also the topic of the, uh, my ESC grant. So what we do now is we print these structures on top of uh, CMOS uh, or standard semiconductor substrates. And their fabrication, again, is a big challenge because as you approach the surface with the writing laser, of course, you get back reflected power, all the properties change. So it becomes quite delicate, again, in terms of characterization. But we can now really 3D print these kind of uh, 3D waveguide topologies on top of 2D uh, CMOS 3.5 uh, or even silicon photonic waveguide structures. Um, so here, for example, these are quantum dot micropillar lasers, which um, uh, not, these are actually samples from Paris, uh, from Sylvain Barbet, where he has uh, micropillar lasers with two quantum wave structures inside. And we can essentially now print all of these kind of waveguides to optically pump them or to connect them. So, and essentially now I think we are in a situation where we can really start to build networks of tens or if the semiconductor material is uniform enough of hundreds or even of thousands of lasers, at, le uh, at least the, the geometric conditions, they are now given. We do not have the problem anymore that our substrate is exploding. We can just print this on top of a 2D array of lasers and make them all interact. And of course, if it works for lasers, in the end you can also do it for quantum uh, sources. So this essentially is the part where we are at, at the moment. Uh, this here is now this article where we give a first outlook towards this direction is now accepted in Nano and should be published within a couple of weeks. So I have a couple of minutes left. So in the end, this was the material part of what we are doing. But I think um, I want to show you a bit more about the neuromorphic computing, the neural network computing we are doing because ultimately this is where I'm coming from. The 3D integration, even though I love it now, uh, it was basically I wanted to solve a problem. I, I'm, I didn't come from this direction. So as before, uh, when I motivated the, the 3D part of uh, our work, I will do the same for the neuromorphic computing. I'll go back to biology because I think, again, there are some very key messages which really uh, they hit home. So what you see here on the left is just from Wikipedia is a Experimental measurement, uh, I think, patch clamp technique of, uh, of a biological neuron, yeah, a spike train. Essentially, the neuron is simulated and it releases a train of spikes. There's a lot of theory behind it, the signal processing, quality, etc. But I want to be much more fundamental, much more simple here. So what you can see roughly is that this little bar here is 50 milliseconds. So let's say these time tra uh, spike trains are separated by 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds tens of milliseconds, it doesn't really matter. Order of magnitude, tens millisecond. So, and then what uh, people are doing, and especially also Simon Thorpe in Toulouse in France, is um, they place a human subject in front of a screen, and then they do very simple tasks. They give them very simple tasks. For example, look at the screen and solve the problem. And here you can see the temporal reaction time with the, uh, the proportion of responses. So it's basically a temporal histogram. And then what you can see here is that, of course, uh, the delay, the reaction time, um, changes with the difficulty of the task. But for the simplest task, and that task is simply, is in that screen you are seeing, do you see a human or not? Um, people are quite quick 
and essentially the th detection threshold is somewhere around 200 250 milliseconds okay so the really interesting bit is that for these kind of simple tasks, uh, neuroscientists have mapped out completely the flow of information through the brain. They know which cortical areas are involved and in which sequence. So that means you can calculate back because we know the propagation delay, we know the reaction time of neurons, and then we can essentially make a calculation what's the lower limit of an optical signal hit, um, hitting our eyeball that information propagating through the brain and uh, reaching our thumb or our, our finger to press the button, say yes, human or not. And it turns out to be exactly this. So that means the information for very simple tasks in our brain is simply flowing through. The first spike already is giving more or less the answer and it's just bouncing around like an echo through different areas of our brain until it reaches the finger. So there is no overhead in temporal processing if the task is simple enough. If we have something a little bit more complex, what you can see, this might increase by a factor of three or four, but not by three orders of magnitude. It's a very constant relationship and it's essentially dominated by signal, uh, signal propagation and maybe sometimes a bit more relaxation dynamics depends on how difficult the task is. So again, I'm not saying anything more how this works. I'm just stating the fundamental relationship between signal propagation and the reaction times. So the same is true when we talk about energy. Yeah. Um, people can measure the energy of, um, I think this is based on red neurons. Um, they can measure that very precisely. And then via physical model, essentially scaling up the geometrical aspects of a neuron because they say, physio physiologically, physiologically speaking, uh, human neurons are very identical to red neurons. It's simply the bigger capacity of the membrane, etc., etc. They can scale this up to um, the energy consumption of a human neuron. And then what they find is essentially that inside of our neocortex, um, the uh, signal creation, so a spike, and signal propagation, they account for 90% of the energy consumption in a biological brain, in our neurocortex. And uh, housekeeping, I, f I love this word, housekeeping, basically it is keeping the brain alive, recycling everything, nutrients, all of this kind of pretty essential stuff, only takes 3%. And this is completely the other way around. If we, Both of these aspects are completely the other way around if you think of our computers. We have transistors that switch with 10 picoseconds. Um, we have systems that essentially are, have signal pathways that go four centimeters where we have nanometer feature sizes. So essentially the temporal as well as the energetic aspects of our computers today are completely different to what the biology is showing us. So, and I think the real um, part in biology and it is captured by this concept is really that a neural network in the end just lets information flow and transforms it. It does not co make complex kind of, you know, uh, rerouting, uh, permanent storage, shuffle it around to another memory. Of course, it does a lot of complex learning dynamics, but in the moment we are doing computation, it's just the dynamical system doing its job. And this is where the energy is going and almost nowhere else. So that means in the end, if we want to go to this direction, we just need, we really need to implement all of this. And we need to implement it such that a classical computer has very little interference into the, you know, uh, real-time information flow and transformation of the system. So the system or the concept which we leveraged for this at the beginning, and we still do, but we're going away from this, is uh, called reservoir computing. So reservoir computing in the end starts with uh, the reservoir here and the reservoir simply is a network of nonlinear dynamical elements. So they can be whatever, a transistor, a semiconductor laser, you know, chemical nonlinearities, thermal, it doesn't really matter. These, connect these elements are connected among themselves, so that makes it a recurrent uh, network, which is a dynamical system. Um, and then this kind of system we connect to input information okay so this could be if you want to do image recognition it could be the pixels of your image or if you want to process the, the data from a sensor it could be a scalar that changes in time for example now the crux of reservoir computing is that in order to compute the output 
Of course, what you need to do is you need to optimize the system that it creates the right connection of data input and um, uh, desired output, basically the desired mathematical transformation that is required for a certain computation. And in reservoir computing, you achieve this by simply changing the output weights from the reservoir to your output uh, 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 channels. In other neural network concepts, you would have to change all of this. So this makes it very easy for experimental implementation. You simply take a high dimensional nonlinear dynamical system, which in physics we have a whole bunch of, you couple it to input information, and then what you need to change is the projection from this dynamical system's response onto your output channels. And that we can do, or at least this is where we started. So the way we did this is uh, we use a large area semiconductor laser. So for example, here is our input information. That's a spatial light modulator. In this case, an array of micro mirrors could be a normal um, you know, liquid crystal display. And here we display our images. And for this proof of concept, it's a very simple task, just Boolean patterns, okay? So that is our input vector. Then what we want is the input weights. And in the original concept, they are random, but constant. So that we realize by imaging that uh, display onto the input facet of a multi-mode fiber. So we illuminate the display, the spatial light modulator with the laser. We image it onto the input of a multi-mode fiber. That implements a random scattering matrix. Importantly, it's constant in time over days. And then at the output, you get a linear multiplication of that random matrix onto your input vector. That transformation we now image onto the input facet of our large area VIXEL. VIXEL is a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. It's a standard semiconductor laser, just a DBR, quantum well, and another DBR. So this section therefore implements the input. And crucial here is there is no overhead. Light just propagates, light mixes linearly, and there is essentially no slowdown and no energy consumption by any kind of digital routing scheme or clocking or anything. It is just flowing of waves in this case. Now, the crucial to this large area VIXEL is that we use a multi-mode VIXEL. So a normal VIXEL would be, let's say, three micrometer in size. That means you have a single mode Gaussian output that means your rate equation model essentially is three-dimensional uh, carrier inversion, field amplitude, and phase. And of course, that's not very high-dimensional, so it would not do for a very, very complex neural network. But now what happens if, if you increase this to, let's say, above 10 micrometers, it becomes very multi-mode, and we have lasers which go up to 80 microns in diameter. We have hundreds and hundreds of modes. And essentially what we do now is we inject this near-field pattern onto the large area VIXEL. So first of all, VIXELs are very non-linear. They have the lasing threshold, they have amplitude phase coupling with uh, Henry's uh, line width enhancement factor, a, a whole bunch of non-linear effects, and they're also quite energy efficient. So somewhere on femtojoule energy you need in order to get a non-linear response. So that's the non-linearity which we need. Now the connections between the different spatial positions of this VIXEL they are also inherent in our substrate. First, we have carrier diffusion in the quantum well. That's a local coupling of the order of microns. Um, then we have the optical diffraction inside of this resonator. So that creates a global coupling. So therefore, again, all of these connections are established free of charge. Uh, there is no routing. Again, it is just flow of information exactly like in our uh, biological, not li exactly like in our bi biological brains, but following the same principle. Information is transformed and it is basically linearly multiplexed. So now, this creates a very high dimension nonlinear transformation of our input image. So how do we transform this into computation? So for that, what we do is we image the near field of the VIXEL onto another spatial light modulator and in reflection of that spatial light modulator we locate a detector. So here this is again a uh, an array of micro mirrors. So either the point in, in the direction of the detector, then we establish a connection from one point of our VIXEL neural network to the detector. If the mirror looks in the other direction, there is no connection. So essentially this large readout layer, these large, uh, this, this last omega out connection, in our case, they are a Boolean uh, matrix. So, 
And this means that we now discretize the spatial response of the laser with these discrete mirror elements and we can therefore say, okay, each mirror corresponds to one neuron. We have discretized our spatially continuous system and now of course the question is at which step size do we uh, discretize, etc., etc. But this is now what we do. Now how do we make the system learn? For example, we want to make the system identify some simple Boolean patterns. Then we say, okay, we want the system to identify pattern 001, which is this one. This one is 00, this is 100, this is 111, okay? Then we know if we inject a random sequence of these, the ideal solution is this magenta line. And we start with a random uh, configuration of these readout mirrors, of these readout weights. We inject this random sequence, we record our error, and we will start with a very bad performance, with the red curve. Yeah? This is essentially up here, this is really experimental configurations. So there's almost no correlation between our output and our desired result. What we then do is we change a few of these mirrors in direction, and we repeat the same sequence. And now we can measure the error, and the error has either dropped or it has increased. If it has dropped, we like this modification, we keep it, we learn it. If it got worse, we refuse it and we change some other mirrors. So it's an iterative update process and as you can see here on the right side essentially our error quite efficiently drops um, down to almost 0% error rate. So here we had 1% error rate for 6-bit header recognition. So there's quite a lot of Boolean combinations already of, this, uh, of these symbols. Yet our system learns it with less than 1.5% symbol error rate. So it's a very simple scheme and of course if you do full optimization, gradient back propagation, etc, etc, you will go to 0%. But the message here is the entire system is doing the computation and we do not know what the system is doing. We leave it be. We just perturb it and see if these perturbations were beneficial. For example, we do not know the state of each neuron in here. For back propagation, you would have to measure the state of each neuron for every example and the state of each connection. So in this case, it's impossible. You would need hundreds of gigahertz probes, a terabyte of memory. So essentially, we sacrifice a bit of this learning performance and all we need to do, we inject examples and we record the output. That's all we observe. And all the rest in between is essentially what well, the system is doing its job. So how this then looks like here, is uh, really this video for me uh, at the beginning I, I was almost getting emotional <laughs> because it took us before it took us a day to record a curve like this and now it's down to 20 seconds and that's down to some very simple stupid MATLAB uh, limitation. So what you see here is now on the y-axis is the error of the output mean square error normalized it's three at the bottom you see the different patterns which we try out and you see it slowly goes down in error until it finds a good direction in the optimization space and then the error really collapses and it goes down to zero. So what you can see here now is essentially the system learning one kind of symbol out of a six-bit header. So this looks fast, it's 20 seconds, but essentially this is really nothing because our Vixel responds with nanosecond timescales the DMD, any matrix operation in the system is passive, so it has effectively, uh, for all uh, intents and purposes, no bandwidth limitation factor. So the current limitation step is we need a network license for MATLAB. That means the MATLAB computer and the scope need to be connected to a switch. So when we transfer the data, we need to go through the university switch in order to read the system. So otherwise, if we just build some, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi hardware, then um, this system would now learn in, let's say, 50 to 100 milliseconds. And if we now really push the system, and uh, we are, I think, one year away of this, then it will learn in 100 microseconds. So these numbers, they seem impressive, but what is really the crux there is that through all of this, the power consumption will not change. And that means the energy consumption actually goes down per operation. So, and this is the same in the temporal do domain as well as in the neuron domain. If we increase the size of the Vixel, then um, the power consumption of the Vixel scales linearly with its area, if we are careful doing it right. So does the power of the injection laser we need. But of course, the dimensionality of our connections, they grow quadratically with the size. So therefore, the energy consumption per connection 
goes down linearly with the size of the system. And these are really some of these aspects which I was talking about at the beginning. What is important is the power consumption per neuron and not per synaptic connection. And this is, I think, where we, what we are seeing here really almost for the, for the first time. So, and this is then essentially the end. I'm five minutes, ten minutes over. And uh, I hope it was interesting and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. Um, I think it, it was very enlightening. Uh, is it uh, really the license limiting you or is it the uh, SLM? No, the, what is limiting us is basically that one of our DMDs is the older generation and it crashes with Python. <laughs> so okay. uh, I, I will come to you back uh, mm -hmm. later. So are there any questions uh, over here? Thank you for your talk. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one question is uh, about your three-dimensional uh, uh, network. Yeah. So how do you, uh, f for this uh, input-output, do you use a uh, taper or uh, if you use coupling taper. about the light? Uh, At the, no, because in the end right now we have full freedom in de defining the mode profile of our input waveguide so we can just perfectly an a, an a match it to whatever we inject. So here we an a matched the, the confinement and the size of the core so that for when we inject with a certain microscope objective, it's matched. So if we have a laser where we want to print on top of it, we measure the mode of the laser, then we just adjust the parameters of our waveguide, we print it directly on top of it, and it's, it's matched. So we do but not have to taper a lot. Yes, but uh, for the future, for real uh, for 20 degree circuit, maybe you need some greeting coupler or kind of how do you... Uh, integrate your, your structure with that kind so, of... Circuit. So the grating uh, coupler you only need when you go from a 2D planar structure yes, to yes. the vertical structure. Yes, yes. Yes. So in this case, let's say they need it. We okay. would not. We would prefer an, a, a, a natively vertical um, arrangement of things. Okay. Um, we are working with people now who give us grating couplers. Then basically we use the grating couplers and collect from, from there and then we do, for example, an inverse taper or a taper to collect that, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. The second question, sorry, <laughs> uh, is uh, about your uh, uh, training, about your DMD kind yep. of stuff. So uh, it's real time or you have some pre-trained uh, neural network or no, it's, it's real just time. real time? It's real time. We start with a random configuration and then okay. you, see, you, you, you see it basically shuffling. What we do is, um, so that goes to your question. So what we do is, uh, for example, this input patterns, we load onto the memory of the DMD. Okay. So that means it's pre-stored. But since this is training data, it never changes. So that means we can cycle through examples at a rate of 15 kiloframes a second, mm -hmm. which is already big. And uh, we are currently developing a, a, a multiplexing concept where we can increase by this by another three or two four orders of magnitude. So then we will be at an injection rate of, let's say, 40 million images a second. Okay, cool. And then basically this is, I think, where we become then very competitive with the other structures. And there we, we use all of this. The training data does not change mostly with time. You know, it's the same as the training set. These readout weights, they change... These readout weights, they change very slowly because you only have to change them once every training, uh, every set of training examples. Mm -hmm. So these, you know, if we inject here, so basically we can speed this up to, to frame rates which are completely outside of the world of electronics and we do not pay a penalty for it. Actually, we gain energy efficiency when we speed it up. Okay, thank you. Very promising. Uh, if I can um, abound in, in his first question, when you write the course with the double uh, with the two photon polymerization, yeah. can you not use the surrounding energy, which is not as concentrated as in the voxel, to, to produce the cladding um, with single photon polymerization? We could, we could, but I mean the point is you don't even need to polymerize the cladding. So we even did that, so we just wrote the cores, and then uh, because that already increases the refractive index of the core, actually we get a stronger confinement. 
Um, and we measured the stability of these structures over, over weeks and months and they seem stable, but I don't really fully trust this because I'm a bit afraid that if you, then you get uh, irradiation from natural light sources, over time the circuit will drift. So this is why we actually prefer to polymerize it and then be done with. And at least over half a year we haven't seen any drift in, in confinement of these waveguides. So... I, <clears throat> congratulations, I mean, I, I like very much your talk, but the, the part of the 3D writing, uh, so do you, because this is very difficult, okay? So have you explored all the, because you have many options in the material or, I mean, they are developing, continuously developing new yes. photo resins, so probably you will have more chances in, in I mean, to find the, the uh, the best one. Uh, yeah, we explored. Say? We tried three. <laughs> what? We, we explored. We tried three. You, you explored <laughs> quite a lot. So we didn't explore at all. Okay, and another small thing yeah. because because I I, th I think you first write with uh, with uh, two photons and mm -hmm. then you glue with single photon. Can you do mm -hmm. the opposite? I, um, you can, but then an issue is that you get aberrant as a function of depth inside of your circuit. So I, what, why, so what it's I difficult to, to avoid then? I mean, because maybe... I, so what you can do is you can compensate for the aberrations, but then also you're limited in size or height of circuit by the working distance of your microscope objective. So this kind of additive upwards creation of the substrate, I think, is much more uh, future-proof. Because, because that could give you some... Mm, chances to, to for material yes. perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is resins where they basically pre-polymerize them and then you write inside of them. There is a lot yeah. in this direction. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think this kind of... Because, you know, it, it's, it's dirty polymers, you know. It is compared to a growing semiconductor, growing... It's so much more forgiving. Uh, I think there is a lot of stuff happening. I mean, right now there is papers coming out every month about a really cool new technique. I think in the next couple of years this is going to go big. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the seminar. It was really nice. Um, just a simple question, and this is in the direction of Alvaros. Um, um, are you limited by the presence, the, the, the starting solutions of the, of the materials that you are employing? Um, so for me, what I would like is one order of magnitude more delta n. That would be beautiful. More, more, more one more, uh, one more uh, t factor of ten of dynamic range in controlling the refractive index, because then we could go down for essentially all wavelengths from visible all the way to C band optics that we can remain single mode. Um, at the limit of the feature sizes we can write. So it's not a matter of concentration, it's a matter of uh, controlling the, the refraction index? The problem is that, um, so, I mean, the pioneer more or less in, of this kind of stuff is, is uh, Professor Wegner in Karlsruhe. And what I read from his papers, the problem is that you have a non-negligible probability of three photon absorption. And what that does to the material is it burns it. So that means as you want to go to higher delta n's with a certain material, instead of, you know, you lose, you gain in fact index contrast, but you get very big losses coming in. So, and this I think is fundamentally limited to this nonlinear printing process. There's this new stuff called two color absorption printing, and that I think is really phenomenal. Um, there I could imagine there is much more range. Um, yeah, from a material point of view, I think there's a lot of things to be explored. I think. You For for here? Yeah. Yes, those those are uh, those are mostly accredites, but uh, the 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 two color absorption and new stuff which they are reporting from Karlsruhe now, I'm not. I don't know so much. Thanks very much. Are there any more questions? I might come with a final one, <laughs> because you insist, as, and I agree, in the power of uh, reservoir computing, but uh, you showed us uh, sort of uh, 
uh, deliberate design of your network. Yeah. So you recognize that disorder and unprogrammed disorder is the source of uh, sort of uh, reservoir computing. Yes. But technology tends to do it with a in a controlled manner, producing four into one or nine into one and so on. So do you think that there is a way in which you, you print a disorder or not a pre-designed system in which you can afterwards create uh, a computing process? Um, yes, I mean, uh, yes and no. You can print a, a dish of uh, spaghetti and yeah. then couple that it's funny you, you call my it's funny you call my wave guide spaghetti because you're not the first one, <laughs> so that's what they've been called the first uh, the first years. Um, I agree that in reservoir computing the power comes from uninten unintentional complexity. It's undesigned. It's just what you get, um, and I think this is what makes it so beautiful. So in the end, if I would go from a conceptual point of view, um, all of the big groups in the world they're going bottom up. They build three neurons in the integrated silicon photonic substrates. They have control over everything, they know everything, and with this they say, look, we have a neural network. Um, but now they're stuck because they, will, they, they cannot go to the numbers which we need. And the point is also that the learning concept does not scale. So I think this is an approach which is completely inspired by deep learning, error back propagation, all of these concepts. The power of reservoir computing is that it allowed us to go exactly the other way. We built since 10 years new neural networks with thousands of neurons. And we are now learning more and more how to control more degrees of freedom of it in order to optimize its computing performance. So I think that is what is the real power of reservoir computing. I think ultimately you cannot get around in having plasticity inside of the network as well. Uh, the reservoir needs to change with time in order to improve the performance and to become competitive. The, the overall accuracy of reservoir computing is fundamentally limited. So now how to optimize that strategy? I think fundamentally again speaking we need to do this as we learn. I think to pre-design a topology um, is helping but it will not get us to the real kind of performance we need. I mean, the system has drift, your data might change, you know, it's, uh, data, if you look at phases in the summer, in the winter, it's not the same. So you need plasticity in your systems. Um, the question now is how can you cleverly adjust this plasticity without having an explosion of computer overhead, uh, how to control these connections. And there I think the, starting with the reservoir is very good. And then, interestingly enough, the last two years they come mathematical concepts how to do this. Some of them are actually 30 years old. And this is where we're going now. So right now, actually, as we speak, in my lab, we're trying to tune the laser and trying to tune the coupling matrix of the input in order to get better performance. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any final questions or remarks? Otherwise, uh, we thank our speaker. And, uh, Thanks for the invitation. <laughs>